sometimes bad things happen. I'm not speaking on unjust killings like Tyree Nichols, George Floyd, but sometimes killings happen. They do. And they're not always unjustified. Um, I, I don't you say that. Because I'm like, do they really need to happen? I really struggle personally when you say that. To start, I absolutely believe that police forces should be a replica of the communities that they serve. Um, so it definitely needs to be diverse um, and look like the community that it serves. Um, I believe police officers have to be cognizant and aware of the actions that they are taking um, and use reasonable force necessary to affect an arrest. Mm -hmm. You can't just be out here beating people and using excessive force, but I also believe that society or communities need to understand that sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes bad things happen. I'm not speaking on unjust killings like Tyree Nichols, George Floyd, but sometimes killings happen, they do. And they're not always unjustified. Um, I struggle I don't, when you say that. Cause I'm like, do they really need to happen? I really struggle personally when you say that. Why so? It just feels that there could be other ways of handling the situation, but you are the expert. I'm the lay person. Um, if there were other ways to handle every situation in that instance, then why is there a need to carry a gun? Oh, so Put in other countries, they don't time in. Please. I would, maybe, I mean, and I, and I want to be mindful, we are in an era of social media and, you know, phones that record and things like that. So maybe it's just a perception. Have police killings of civilians, regardless of race, like been holding steady at a steady rate and we're just learning more about it because of all sorts of cameras? Or has there been a spike, let's say in the last 20 years? I haven't looked at the uniform crime report, but that is all public record that's tracked by the FBI. So you can look that up. Um, it's not something that is new. Uh, they have been happening for years. I, and I know. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that since in the 70s, it was much higher than okay. it is now. It has helped steady probably in the last 15 years, roughly a thousand killings per year, but that was probably five times higher um, back uh, in 50 years ago. So they made thank no thank you for saying that because again i i always know that the perception because everything like everywhere you go now you're being taped somewhere that right. i was just like maybe it's just it appears that there's more not saying that it's okay or not okay or anything that sort yeah. but i'm like maybe it's a perception thing that because now you can't walk down the street without being on someone's street camera that it feels like there's more than there always yeah. been. i mean the washington post has the database that goes back quite a ways. Um, and this is journalists verifying individual in instances. Um, but that's where I get that understanding from. But um, it is it has kind of been steady for quite a while now, you know, and I don't know what that means, but um, even what before and after cameras, you know, um, so. Mar Marcus, would you, as, as you think about kind of your future, I don't know what your background family life is. I don't know if you're married or you have kids or one day want to have kids. You know, you, you have acknowledged that bias exists, right? 
And last time you also acknowledged that if it exists, it probably exists some places in the in the police force, not everywhere, not everybody. And maybe not even, maybe not even, you know, different sometimes between some, you know, black police officers or white police officers, as we saw. I mean, who knows the degree to which race played a role in that incident. Um, would you, being a police officer, would you give the talk to your kids about how, would you worry about some police officer not showing, using reasonable use of force? And would you worry it, worry about it more because your child would be black? Like, would that be a consideration for you? Honestly speaking, yes, I would probably give my child that talk. Okay. But I would also give them the talk that they are to be respectful. Yeah. That they will go out the same as my mom and dad did. You act like you have some home training mm -hmm. and you represent this household accordingly and you represent it well and you do not bring shame to the family. Mm -hmm. But Ooh, yes, oh. I would have to talk with them. Mm -hmm. And I guess how, so there's the broader question that Marin asked just about <clears throat> the approach of police, regardless of the color of the victim, right? Or perpetrator, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, right? Or what, what the case is. Um, and I guess, what do you think, it seems sometimes, and I whether or not it happens more, the fact that it happens means it's an issue to, to improve, meaning unreasonable use of force, right? Absolutely. What do you, what do you think is behind the instinct in those cases when it seems like the action of a civilian leads to a level of force that 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 doesn't seem equivalent to to the the potential harm that could exist but i don't know what it's like to be a cop so i don't know if there's a if there's a a quickness because of a fear or i i don't really know what it's what it's like but um, but in those cases, what, and, and then how does that play out differentially in your mind? Cause you would have the talk based on race. Um, what's, what's your, what's your sense of it as a, as a cop? I think that all of us as humans, we are imperfect people and there are lack, lacks or errors in judgment per se. And so you can assess the situation completely wrong or you could just be dead ass wrong and wanting to use excessive force. Each situation is completely different, um, but it's an error in judgment and you act unaccordingly and you, you screw it up. Um, I can't sit here and tell you that I've always made the right judgment. Mm -hmm. I haven't done anything just outwardly crazy that would be the equivalent of anything that we've seen on TV or the media, but it's basically us as a profession holding each other accountable. Um, yes, de-escalation techniques should be taught. Um, yes, we are to be gatekeepers or bystanders and make sure that our counterparts are acting accordingly and that we hold them accountable. So we do receive that training. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a huge misconception with the where society is trending on what police actions should be. Everyone wants to be an expert in the subject matter. Everyone thinks that they know best, that it's the training and they need more training or they need this or it should be handled this way or it should be handled that way. And like, they have no idea. No. Educate us. Educate us. That's why I wanted you here. But I, you just have a misconception of what reality actually is. And so I know in the first conversation, um, Marion talked about pouring resources into like the south side of Chicago and taking that money away from the police and pouring it into education or programs to uplift the community. But here we go again, twofold. 
why is there a need or propensity for police to have to be in that community in those numbers? Why do we have communities with homes that have burglar bars on? That's why the police are there in massive numbers because crime is rampant. So you can't just defund the police and pour resources into these programs. And it's probably gonna sound really callous to say, but you can pour money into these areas. You can, whatever the case may be, whatever you think the best approach is, but unless someone has the mindset to accept it, or per se, as Susan says, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You have to be mentally able to accept it and move past what you know. So that's why I'm saying it's it's taught, it's learned. People don't know what they don't know. And yes, if you can reach one person, excellent. Well, I'm all for it. But I also think you're always going to have a section of society that is there because that's all they know and they have no no reasoning or mental capacity to even want to change the situation, if that makes sense. What are, I don't say that to, to sound callous, but it is what it is. I guess what I'm just trying to channel, channel what I, what I would imagine someone might say um, and, and, and who, who might even agree with what you, with what you just said. Um, I guess someone might wonder is some of is some of you don't know what you don't know a plant that was that was seeded in the past or not seeded right so like are we if we're not investing in 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 people to see other other possibilities right are we just setting it up to continue in the same way where you still need the police resources like is this an issue of trying to transition to a different reality, but still needing to, you still have the consequences of lack of investment in the in the past, right? Um, and maybe what you're saying, Marcus, is don't take away from one and put it into the other. Maybe you're saying we need both. Maybe you're saying we still need Absolutely. to protect because there was lack of investment. People don't have those other, the sense of other opportunities and you can't just ignore that as a reality. But I think what the other side fears or gets concerned about is, but if you're just pouring into police, you're solving old problems and you're not investing in new solutions. So you don't get a, a batch of people 10 years from now who you need to guard, who you need to protect against again. Um, and so I don't. And so, kind of so more so, to, go ahead, Mark, please. More so, we live in a microwave society. So the notion is defund the police and fund this. Well, if you defund the police solely to fund this, there's going to be a lack in public safety. So maybe you fund this and maybe that's going to put you in a deficit or it's going to be hard to fund it initially. But if your program succeeds, then you can start pulling funds from here. But you can't completely defund one to the point that you're sacrificing public safety mm. because it's funded to this level for a reason. Mm. But when did you tie it back to history, which is how I made the transition to policing, because I'm deeply interested in when do you stop using the historical operating model of what's always happened for a locality and start doing something new? So maybe I accept what you're saying, maybe defund the police is not the answer, but the current operating model is also giving the perception of devastation, right? It's just not working. So, you know, what? I, I, where where do the police become adaptable to begin to try new operating models? What about the current model is not working? Well, when to quote a study that I recently heard, so like Maren was talking about with respect to the deaths of all races, you know, that is sort of, you know, at a steady state. I think Landon spoke to that. However, there are situations when you have non-lethal force applied disproportionately to black people. And so there, so maybe, maybe shootings are not occurring with some sort of racial bias, but the use of use of force or 
in general, over policing, there is some undercurrent of that, right? And that's not working because that's all all that doing all that's doing is feeding the negative tension to uh, to encounter. Right. Uh, to create those situations when you stop a person for their tags, they come at you hard and they start insulting you, et cetera, right? That, that's, that's not a tenable situation. We can't all, this can't be the okay corral where we're all with guns and I'm just going to shoot you, you shoot me, et cetera. Yeah, so, yeah. Because uh, I was going to say, like, even now, I, I was of the, of the belief of when people are stopped by the cops and they run, they must like, why are you running if you've done nothing wrong? I definitely was of that, in that camp, probably as soon as two or three years ago. But again, you know, now this is why I asked the question about, you know, police, you know, killings, if they are trending up or not, because it feels like it is. And I am now of the camp where I understand a person running out of fear for their life, just period. Um, you know, before even figuring out if they're being stopped for their tags or because they are, you know, they resemble a suspect of something. And, you know, is that now being taken into consideration that a lot of times people's reaction now is not necessarily defensiveness because they've done something wrong or they know they're in the wrong, but just out of fear? I think there is a very extremely small percentage of police contacts that go awry to that level. There are millions, millions of contacts with police that go perfectly fine, but because of social media and everything being amplified and put in your face, now it just seems as if it's the wild, wild west and all the police are doing is out here beating and killing people. Well, I don't want to say that, but, and I want to bring Susan and Landon into this too, because this is your country and this is your local law enforcement policing your neighborhoods as well. But there are social scientists who have studied and seen that, that not that it's the wild, wild west, but there is a disproportionate amount of force, not necessarily lethal, applied to Black people. And again, that's why I'm saying that police forces should look like the communities that they serve. So in the first conversation, uh, I think I briefly spoke on what it feels like to be a black cop and how I'm treated by the community. Mm. You should want to see me there. Well, I don't wanna see you there if you were also gonna apply lethal force, I mean, force to me. Like, I mean, I, I, I accept what you're saying, but I also feel that the lack of humanity, you know, human consideration is happening with police, irrespective of the race of the officer. No, I, I see what, I, I think I get what you're saying, Andre, in terms of if one of the benefits or one of the alleged benefits or proposed benefits of having a more diverse police force is that you are more likely to relate to and or understand or, and or, you know, kind of calm and de-escalate situations because you can relate to, you know, the person being stopped or anything of that sort. That's one thing. But if it feels like, oh, you're just falling in line with all the other cops and treating me the same way, like, now what? But that goes back to assumptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You feel, you feel, Marcus, that that in your experience, on average, not, not, you know, there's of course exceptions to this, but on average, you feel like a, like black law enforcement tends to be more conscious of how they treat a black civilian versus a white civilian. That it's not to say they can't have their own biases, but, but maybe some of those biases would be in general, on average, less than a white police officer, for instance, even if there are exceptions, you know, like a, like a Tyree Nichols kind of incident. Is that, is that what your sense is or your experience? From an aspect of relatability, because although we are all more alike than we are different, there are cultural differences. So yes, I'm going to understand a black person. If I go to a disturbance, and it's between a wife and a husband and they're amped up yeah absolutely i'm going to be able to relate to them more and converse with them in a manner 
better than one of my white counterparts. Yes, because I understand them culturally. Mm. The, the way we talk is different. The way we communicate is different. Our mannerisms are different. Yes, we're all human. We're alike, we have more similarities, but there are small little nuances that are different amongst us. And yes, I'll understand them better. Susan and Landon, you you both brought up in kind of the after after conversation talk with Andre and I that you had a particular interest in in this conversation around police community relationships. How do you take all this in, and what are you what are your thoughts? What are you curious about? Yeah, um, I I often wonder. Um, I I think that there there are valid studies that indicate that if you take um, go to a city, take um, instances that happen that are very very similar to each other and the only thing different is race so you isolate the racial variable across multiple cities um, what you find is that the killings um black people are not killed at different rates but they are uh, subjected to higher force uh, there's more use of force um, if you know that's as close as you can get to an answer i think uh, to these studies right to control all of the because there's so many variables including race that are happening uh at these at these scenes right um that's my understanding as it is right now um but then i i wonder like when you extract race from the equation you know you have the very geographical effects you have um you know higher criminality in certain black populations in males especially um, does that lead to higher frequency of encounters? Does that lead to differences in the nature of the encounters? Do, do the cops feel, I'll ask you, Marcus, do the cops feel a little bit more danger from uh, a black male on average um, in those stops? Does that lead to, to them overcorrecting and have higher use of force? I, I would I'd like to know what goes through a cop's mind in assessing risk, you know? That hasn't been my personal experience. I can say, do I believe there have been times where I've been on a scene with one of my counterparts and I thought that they perceived a black male as more dangerous or aggressive than he actually was? Yeah. Yes. But I step in in those instances. I'm, I'm just not standing idly by. So, so it has to be you being there that saved something potentially you know, just severely discriminatory from happening, right? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But at the same notion, when you take criminal histories and past behaviors and contacts into context, then, yeah, I mean, that all plays a pivotal part in it. Are we just out here pulling over Andre and automatically assuming that he's aggressive or he's a threat? No, that hasn't been my experience. No. Susan, I, I, no, I just have a thought. I think it's I think it's unfair to put all of this on any disparities or that are in we're talking about here. I, it's unfair to put that on the backs of cops specifically because there's a structure above them and around them. There's a whole justice system and a local mm. governments that impose certain things and. Um, I'm familiar processes that just can put certain people and minorities, blacks in certain communities. I think that's happened in Ferguson, that there was just a, a just a horrible, vicious cycle of putting people through, you know, a minor, some minor infraction that just ex keeps escalating into something just worse and worse and worse because they can't respond to it in a way that they need to because of their situation. Um, and they just get caught up in this vicious system. May I amplify just... that point, Susan? Because I think you're making a very important point. Uh, there is a structure that is, you know, outside of cops. That's why I often refer to local law enforcement as the gatekeepers of the rule of law, and you have the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is also very financially burdensome. And now, its motivation, I'm not going to get into, but it is. And oftentimes you can be uh, an offender because you're unable to meet the financial obligations of, have, of going through the criminal justice system. So crime, and, and possibly this is all as a deterrent, but crime 
for certain people, especially if you are already socioeconomically disadvantaged, like Marin was talking about, we need to use a little bit of that lens of history just to tie the conversation together, then you are going to be a recidivist criminal. If you don't pay your warrants, you're going to jail. So on Marcus's little computer, when they be in that little cruiser, your name going to pop up. Oh, this, this person has warrants. That's why in some places have warrant amnesty day where you just go in like, look, what, what can we do so I can settle my, so I'm not taken and just yanked off the street. And that's why, and you know, some, and when you already have, you know, police officers that are in neighborhoods looking for criminality, because that is part of their job. And then you have the burden of the criminal justice system. Then it seems as though when you stop, you know, black males that they are more part or more likely to participate in criminality. I'm not saying that for some that's not the case, but other, but there is an element of just the burden of going through the criminal justice system that could be disproportionately onerous vis-a-vis -vis the crime that you committed. Yeah, I think you put that really. That you're well. getting engaged, Andre. You're saying you're getting you're getting engaged um, disproportionately in a way that that then becomes kind of a, a cycle of contact and maybe sometimes. And I'm also saying that part of, part of what keeps part of the grease of that cycle is the financing that it takes to go through the criminal justice system. So mm -hmm. go, going to court costs money, tickets cost yeah. all these things cost money. And when you ain't got no money or you, you yeah. when you have to go and pay yeah. your baby mama's rent or this, or these, you know, or taking care of your warrants, then, and for a lot of people, it comes down to something like that. Not everybody's sitting in homes and this, you know, cool. And or whatnot. showing up in court. Just or even showing up in court because you can't get off. And so yeah. I'm saying that part of the grease of that sort of vicious cycle is the financial aspect of it. And it can make it seem as though that there's an element of, you know, Black people who are just, they're just prone to criminality. They're just bad, B-A-D, when there is a lot more lens and nuance at play. So it's disproportionate well, it because of disenfranchisement. In that is definitely a, a contributing factor. And, but I don't I don't want to take away from Susan what Susan said, because I'm not trying to put all, all of it on any one thing. I just want to make sure that the group is aware of the diversity of what's required when you get caught up in the criminal justice system. I... Um, that's a really good. Um, that's really strong, Andre. I, I and I'm not. I wasn't aware of that. I guess or thought of that as a factor, but that makes a lot of sense to me. And you know the, you know I would say that the shootings that have come through social media have increased a lot of people's awareness, and that led to some good things, some reforms that really do make sense. It's just then they needed some, um, you know, some extra energy to actually make it happen, right? Absolutely. Um, there had to be a catalyst and that that's not to say that you know it doesn't have some downsides as well right um but you know i, I would like to see some energy injected into that aspect of things as well and appreciated a little bit better i think could do a lot of good i'm also kind of sorry we're just framing every question to marcus in terms of him being a cop i mean that act that's i mean I'm sorry about that, Marcus. That I want okay. you know you know that I see you gotta you gotta bear the burden, Marcus. Marcus. He can take it. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's it's it's. I find your place in society, Marcus, very. I have a lot of empathy. Um, I really do. You know, because I I know that you have expressed the idea that you understand that a on average, not with every situation that a black person is going to get less grace. And, you know, in interactions with the law enforcement, that grace has a can have a bigger consequence, even if it's just even if it's not a shooting, even a higher level force. That's, that's a that's a consequence. It's an experience, a negative experience with people you think are supposed to protect you, you know. Um, and so, you know, I. You know, I, I feel this tension in me experiencing the tension in you, you know, really, I mean, I understand, I mean, you play a role, you know, you and your fellow colleagues play a role, you do play an important role, a foundational role, safety, 
You know, we don't have a society in order to society if we don't have safety, you know, and it's so important, you know, but then when, when, you know, when I hear you say things about like soft on crime and I hear you, you know, soft on like crimes that are going to lead to, to someone else getting hurt, you know, we got to guard against that. But then I hear soft on crime. Well, what about those times when someone didn't get the benefit of the doubt? They didn't get grace. And now they're a part of a system, you know, that might take them in a direction that, that isn't a productive one. And I don't know how to solve that tension, but I, I feel empathy in the same way that Susan does that, you know, it, you must feel like it's on, like you bear the burden of this tension because of the role that you have. Um, and the funny thing is <laughs> I can go to work yeah, and I'm answering questions on, well, why are the black people like this? And why is it this? And why do black people feel this way? And then I get off work and it's, well, why are the cops like this? And why do the cops do this? And I'm just like, Jesus yeah, yeah. Christ. Tell them to watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. You're like the middleman in between these two worlds trying to, to share understanding. Um, that's because a tough of the, place. The place that you sit. But do they that respond to you? Me? Do they listen to you? Like, do you, do you feel like when you explain, give an understanding of where parts of the black community's hearts and minds are and what they experience that might be valid in, in generating. So do, do you feel like, like you get understanding on the other side or? Um, I think so for the most part. Even when it comes to um, black lives matter. Yes. I try to make it relatable. Mm -hmm. um, now, whether they leave a green or, or not. Yeah. And again, we already had the conversation on how I feel about it, but I'm not oblivious to why people feel that way. So I just yeah. try to make it understood of why it is what it is. So do you think there's anything positive in the message? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I'll, last question. And then Mary, you jump in. Do you think there's anything positive in the message of Black Lives Matter? Put aside. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So you see the value in it. You yes. see the value in this idea of black lives are worthy of caring and dignity. You might Absolutely. have a difference in approach of how they approach expressing that or wanting to change, but you see, you see the value, you see the value in it. Sorry, Mary. Absolutely. But because I just feel, and again, there are some justified instances where people have unfortunately been killed, but I don't think society is trending in a direction where they accept that or they acknowledge it because they don't think the police should ever be out here shooting people, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, sorry, Marion, you were gonna- you No, know. I was, so I was just gonna say with, with all this, I don't recall you telling us, Marcus, like, were you always interested in being a police officer? Like what led to you pursuing that line of work? Again, and I'm just, viewing this in the context of everything you shared about being a black police officer. And I know we've talked before about the grumblings of, you know, what many in the black community think about the cops. I'm interested in your pursuing that line of work. So as a kid, I kind of wanted to do it. Uh, when I graduated high school, I went to college and I completely shied away from it. I went to college as a business major and I wanted to be in business and accounting. And then somewhere along the way, it just piqued my interest again. I changed my major back to criminal justice. Um, but what I really wanted to do is when I graduated, I wanted to go into probation or parole, but I couldn't find a job because I didn't have any case management experience. And so I took a job with a nonprofit doing Hurricane Ike recovery after Hurricane Ike to get that case management experience. And then when I got laid off from that job, um, I just had this thought, like, I'm going to go to the police academy. Well, I actually got laid off and I didn't get a severance package. So all the money that I had saved, I was using to live on and I couldn't even pay for the police academy. And so I went to my church and I asked for help and my church actually cut the check for me to go to the police academy. So I didn't get I didn't get hired on and sent to the academy for my job. My church paid for it. Wow. Um, and then I applied with the department that I'm at now and I got the job. So the reason I wanted to go into law enforcement is because 
I genuinely had an interest in helping and being a good role model for my community. Um, growing up in my hometown, um, although it was very diverse, there was only one black cop in the whole town. And I really, really looked up to him. And I recalled going to a football game and I got into it with someone and I, I was being disrespectful and I was cussing and acting a fool. And I just remember him walking up behind me and grabbing my shoulder. And he was like, what would your dad say if he knew you was out here talking like that? And the next day he showed up to my house and he told on me and I was just like, man, are you serious? So <laughs> I always just looked up to him and I don't know. That was just, I never had a bad experience with the police and I just kind of defaulted back on it and thought that it would be something that would be good if I did my part. I mean, I, I love that story so much for so many reasons from the church paying for it to all of that. But even what you just described there, I've always said, you know, things would be so much better if, you know, when we get into like cops knowing the people or living in the communities that they police, because there is something to be said of, you know, you see, you know, a kid, you know, out there acting a fool, whatever, and be like, that's Marcus's kid. Just, just go get him and take him home. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> go get him take him me. home. Like I know his dad. Like that's so much better than a lot of, you know, what we see nowadays and to a certain extent like in suburban Dallas that's what I grew up with it was the you know my brother's best friend's dad was like pretty high up in the Arlington Police Department and yeah he'd be like I got him that's Mike's son yeah. <laughs> you know I think, I think the hard thing is is the perception is mostly negative and you don't see the humanity in police and you you never ever so often you will hear about the nice things that they've done or but you, you don't see the day-to-day -day of it so it's tiring because you go out and you do these good deeds and you can encounter a homeless person and go get them a room or buy someone's food that they were stealing from the store or it's just countless things that you never ever hear about mm. but every day is like the police are this, the police are that, boom, boom, boom. And it, it just, it's exhausting. I'm telling y'all, seriously, it's yeah. very tiring. So Andre, how does that all sit with you? Cause I know you, you have feelings about, have had feelings about the police. Oh, uh, we're questioning me now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, just cause I know you, <laughs> I know how much this, I know how much you feel about this. How do you feel hearing Marcus's story and knowing that there are Marcuses out there in the police force? Like what, what does that do for you? Well, uh, Mark, number one, Marcus, thank you for sharing that. Because in the years that I've known you, I don't think I've ever quite uh, known the tale of how you came into this line of work. Uh, how that sits with me, it's, it's just fine. And I, what, you know, to quote Mary Ann Williamson, the only thing missing is what you're not giving, right? And so as a community, what we feel is lacking from the police, i.e. maybe support, we need to give that. And also from uh, the police officers, I would counsel you, remember your story. Remember when you wanted and you didn't have, or when you didn't have the awareness that were, there were people there to educate you. Remember, baby, sorry, I don't, I, sometimes I get like that. Remember, sir, that, uh, you know, there was once time when you had the awareness and you were popping off at the mouth and someone either gave you that grace or then that officer helped you, right? So that's part of the fullness of humanity that we've all been talking about. And those lenses and how every lens is valid and the history, because, you know, as you, I'll be perfectly honest, you know, I just don't, I'm starting not to see segregation in history. I'm starting to see Susan's history as a white woman, Marin's history as a black woman, my history as a gay black man, Landon's history, and all of you as our own personal stories. And meaning, meaning I'm a part of all of it because we're all a part of humanity. And, you know, how we, and to tie back to Todd and his very, very inspiring story with his foster daughter and his, and his and the child that he has with his wife, you know, and, and he was telling me, and, and Todd always melts me because I try to be all hard and then he'll tell a story. And I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> Marcus seems pretty good at it too, though. That was Marcus awesome. is good at it. And I just want to say, like, can we just remember that, you know, when because tonight when Todd is going to rock his Black foster daughter to sleep, when Marcus may go to work in a few days and he encounters that person who doesn't have that awareness and maybe they are popping off up the mouth and they have warrants or, you know, for everyone else on the phone, just please remember remember that. That's why I pray, you know, very hard. I'm someone who believes in the Lord and I pray very hard that this makes it out there because that's the, that's the awareness. So it, it sits with me just fine. And I just implore Marcus to remember the awareness of love and humanity 360. Well, have a wonderful time. And you guys, I just feel connected to you. So, you know, this is great. I love you guys. I feel the same. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank you for creating this space and opportunity, Todd and Andre. Looking forward to the next round of videos. Sounds good. Thank, Thank, you, for, Thank you all for joining us. It uh, means a lot to us, and uh, uh, it was very fulfilling to hear the conversation. And thanks for sharing. Look, I'm gonna throw it out there. Hopefully, we can do it again. I <laughs> know. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'll. I'll ping you. I'll ping y'all. I would love it. I feel a third conversation, and also because uh, I did not. I did not um, make good on my word to Susan that we were going to get back to meritocracy. So uh, yes. um, I feel okay. personally obliged to make that the first conversation in our third conversation. Yes. There's the hook <laughs> for the Do next it. one. <laughs> so so okay. I am sorry, Susan. I thought we would wrap up okay. and move on, but but I think it was the conversation was wonderful. So hopefully you're you're okay with it, Susan. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, hope you guys enjoy the party. What's that? I hope you guys enjoy the party. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we will. Yes, we will. Vegas, Don't party yeah. too hard. Marcus <laughs> we will because he'll be, see me be dignified. So now it will be so bad if he sees me it'll be a little bit debaucherous. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I think we'll all have a good time. Yeah. Have fun. Oh, all right, y'all. Have, have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your evening. Bye bye. 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 Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you wanna see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. Especially since you were talking about the, a feeling of lack of support as a Black police officer from the Black community. How do you manage that duality of being an officer of the law being an authority figure, but also with the what feels like venomous relationship Blacks have with the police right now, having to also want to be a part and fit in into the Black community. How do you deal with these variables? To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.